but <laughs> because what we just said spoke to your life mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we can be a service to you and others. Keep going. There you go. And I, and I love it. Like it's for me, this was, this, I used to die on this hill all the time. Like I lived this life, right? I was the guy who was in my righteousness. I was right. And it didn't matter that you disagreed with me or that you weren't going to listen. You were just an idiot and you had the right to be an idiot. I was going to keep being right. That was my belief. Right. And what I started realizing was I looked around, it was like, I wasn't helping. This business podcast, the two business guys mastermind uncovers for you secrets and share tips and tricks to entrepreneurship as they mastermind on how to have startup operational and overall business success so that you can go on to get better results enjoy all right everybody we're back rob has been doing some amazing things you know doing golf and all that stuff y'all know how i feel about golf uh and uh having breakfasts and i've been coming to the breakfasts but we want to talk about today is your clients your clients hate you and you probably hate them. So <laughs> Rob and I have been, he's been coaching me up on uh, working with clients because typically, you know, you know, I like the solopreneur approach, right? Build your business be in a room and make millions of dollars, blah, blah, blah. But he has been coaching me because a lot of clients, because of the work that I've been doing, have been asking me for their, for my help. And the struggle begins. And I was talking to Rob and I says, Hey, Rob, I think my, I think my clients have they, they hate me, and I sure, I sure feel I have a feeling about them. I mean, we're we're talking metaphorically, y'all, but of it course, is in the course. struggle, yeah, for who's going dominance. to do what, whether it is a freeing control, a dominance. If you're out there right now and you're working with clients, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. You're a consultant out there, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about. So yeah. Rob just said something, and I want him to repeat that on <laughs> how you. Don't come in as the person that gets the shine for having suggested the smart thing, Bill, because you know what you're doing. Yeah. You're making them the hero. Yeah. Yeah. That that is something, you know, we've talked about this before. Donald Miller story brand, the whole idea you're walking alongside the guy. I really took that to heart. And what I've noticed in, you know, these relationships, what, what winds up happening is, right, we as as the experts in whatever we do, it doesn't matter if you're doing, you know, um, doing hair, doing makeup, doing uh, accounting, doing manufacturing, doing uh, leadership, doing marketing. It doesn't matter what you're in. You spent a lot of time doing the work that you do, honing your skills, honing your craft, becoming an expert in your space. Right. And so you go to help people. And in our minds, we're like, I know what I'm doing. Just listen to me. Get out the way and mm-hmm. we're going to get there. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is we forget who we're helping, right? And I think one of the interesting things, I heard somebody say this quote one time, and it was like, you're only helping if you're helping. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? And then it was like, no, you're only helping if you're actually helping. Trying to help doesn't matter. Doing all the right things to help doesn't matter. It's only help. If the other person is actually help. And so often when we get into these kind of, you know, the, 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 these, 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 these uh, power struggles, right? Expert versus owner. What happens is we wind up dying on the hill of righteousness, self-righteousness. I am right. And, you know, I talk to a lot of the managers that I teach because I go in, in, in the companies and I teach managers this this very specific thing because a lot of middle managers struggle talking up the chain, right? Getting yeah. their ideas right They're on the floor. They know exactly what the problem is. They know exactly yeah. what we need, right? I remember one of my clients, for seven years, they had needed to purchase a saw to change yeah. because, you know, one of the big things that the, 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 the materials came in certain dimensions and it didn't fit the saw they had. So they were throwing away a lot of materials. They had been asking for a new saw for seven years before I saw this problem. Now, the saw cost $25,000. Not a, you know, cheap <laughs> ornament, right? 
but seven years, they couldn't get this 25,000. So a lot of middle managers are struggling with this. And this is exactly what, what happens for a lot of service professionals as well. You're struggling talking to the owner because here's the thing that we, right, we're experts, we made it. But when you're talking to the owners of your business or people who are in executive roles, what you have to realize is they're the expert at what they do. That's how they got there, mm. right? An owner of a business had to, you know, Fight through all the arrows and all the things that come with mm -hmm. starting a business. And, you know, mm -hmm. Randy, you and I have coached hundreds of beginning entrepreneurs. We know this this this, this gauntlet very well. Mm -hmm. It takes a tremendous amount of intestinal fortitude and will and desire and perseverance to get to the point where you can start hiring other people to help you run your business. Mm. And so they have an ego. They have an expertise. They have a mastery as well. And so when you get two alphas clashing... This is what's going to happen. And one of the problems that a lot of us realize, both in middle management and as service providers, is that we are not the alpha in that exchange. We are the helper. We are the guide. They are the hero. Right. And so um, a lot of times what will happen is we'll go into those situations and we won't be able to uh, get. What's it called? We won't be able to get them to hear what we're saying and we will choose to die on the hill of righteousness. I'm right. And if you can't see that I'm right, I guess we're yeah. just not going to move forward. Yeah. And coach, man, interesting... coach, I'm listening. I'm wide open. Coach, are you, are yeah, you all yeah. listening to this? If you're listening <laughs> to this, hit the like button. Right. Smash hit the, the like, thumbs comment. up because what we just said spoke to your life mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we can be of service to you and others. Keep going. There Rob. you go. And I, and I love it. Like, it's for me, this was this. I used to die on this hill all the time. Like, I lived this life, right? I was the guy who was. In my righteousness, I was right. And it didn't matter that you disagreed with me or that you weren't going to listen. You were just an idiot and you had the right to be an idiot. I was going to keep being right. That was my belief. Right. And what I started realizing was I looked around. It was like I wasn't helping. I was just being right. And mm. I talked to my I talked to the leaders that, that that I deal with a lot. And I'm like, you being right does nothing other than serve your ego. Right. F right. Right. Righteousness being right is necessary for leadership, but it's not sufficient. Right. And if you're going to actually make a difference, if you're actually going to add value, if you're actually going to help, like we talked about earlier, you have to realize that you also have the responsibility to influence. And you can't influence others just based on your righteousness alone. Your righteousness has to connect with them. Right. And so you have to be able to get them to see your position, get them to see differently and therefore behave differently so that they can get different results. Then you will actually have helped rather than just trying to help. And there's a lot of people out there that's trying to help. And like I said, there were seven years that they were trying to help the company. We need a new saw. We need a new saw. We need a new saw. Now, this company, they were losing on order of 250 to $300,000 a year in material costs, material waste costs, because they didn't have this saw. But guess who knew that? Nobody. When I got there, one of the first questions I asked was like, you need a new saw. Why you need a new saw? Well, because we throwing away a lot of material. Well, what's a lot? Well, I, I don't know exactly how much, but it's a lot. Ah, right. Let's quantify. Because guess what? The people that you're trying to convince, they know that a saw costs twenty five thousand dollars. And if you can't the tell them. Part. Exactly. If you can't tell them when they're going to get that twenty five thousand dollars back by buying this saw. It's a non-starter because their job, the only way you help them is by helping them to invest time, money, and resources better. That is brilliant. And I tell you, I love the idea, title part, right? Expert versus owner. Mm -hmm. So that in my mind is the title of how you should be approaching things. Expert yeah. versus, because mm -hmm. as the expert, the owner called you in. Exactly. But have we exactly. forgotten that the owner is the expert in having created this thing? So exactly. And in their vision and in where in. this thing is going and all the rest of that. And, and I think that's the thing. Expert versus owner as opposed to helper. Right. When you have that conflict, when you're looking at an expert versus owner, the things you have to realize is you're not helping. Right. When I was in the Marine Corps. And I was, I was telling you this off camera, right? When I was in the Marine Corps as an attorney, one of the first things they taught us was you have to learn how to advise commanders. Commanders are expecting to get what they want. They're wanting what they want. And they're, they're having you on their staff not to tell them what they can't do. 
That's not your job. And if you do your job that way, because, right, lawyers are like, here's what the rule is. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. Right. A lot of times I remember, Randy, you said this question. We were talking about this. You're like, when, when somebody asks you, so what do you think? We think that they're really asking us, what do we think? They're not. That's not what they're Brilliant. asking. <laughs> right there. <laughs> when in the advisory role, in the cons uh, in the consulting space, you're not being asked what you think, or you should know that that's a trap. This is exactly. what I it's didn't know. This is what I didn't yeah. know. Having worked for yeah. again, you know, solopreneur, kind of doing your own thing, blah blah blah, lending your talents from time to time, you're not developing that skill to that's know key. that it ain't your advice that they want, really. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what is and it, then, Rob? What do they want? Right. So, so the thing that they want is they want you to help them figure out how to get what they want, but mm. they don't want you. They don't want your advice on it. They want the thing. Your advice is a means to an end. It doesn't have value outside of its ability to get them what they want. And so, if your advice is don't do that, you haven't helped them. You haven't gotten them closer to what they're trying to do. Because the only reason they're asking you, what do you think, is because they're trying to get somewhere and they're trying to figure out what's the best way to get there. And so what I always tell people is, right, I do this with my clients. We're not going to, you're going to be mad at me if you ever ask me, what do you think I should do? And you expect me to give you an answer because I'm not going to give you an answer because it doesn't matter what I think you should do. Because at the end of the day, it's not my business. I'm not the one that's got to do it. I remember when I was a defense counsel, I used to tell my clients all the time. Don't ever ask me whether you should take the deal or not. I'm not going to tell you yes or no. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what you decide, I'm going home to my family. You might be going to jail. You have to be comfortable with living that with that decision. Not me. Because I ain't got to live with it. And I learned so in that moment. Right? Like I, I learned really quickly that it's that, that, that the best help that I can give for them was not to tell them what I think. I'm not really in their situation. The best help I can give them is to help them get clarity on what they think, what they want, what they're willing to deal with, what they're willing to tolerate. Because at the end of the day, real realistically, with any business owner that you're dealing with, they're the one that's going to gain or lose money based on whatever decision they make. You're already paid. You already got oh. the check is cash. It's in the bank. You've already done your thing. Right. This right here. Ask clarity. Yeah. Are y'all hearing this? Because. And what I'm, what I sense, what I'm taking from this, Rob, or what I hear you saying is mm -hmm. that we can see where they're wrong, but that's not the point. Exactly. The point is, how do we, and, and stop me, if, how do we make them right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and on the way to making them right, how do we help them see if they're wrong? Right. So that it's not us saying, no, don't go that way. Right. It, now, this is harder. It's more difficult. It takes more time. You got to work on it. You got to learn. Like I've done lots. Of, I'm, I'm a certified coach. I've done tons of training, tons of different read tons of books and stuff like that. Like, so I'm not saying, hey, this is easy. It's not right. My legal training is preparing me for all this stuff as well. The thing about it, though, is. Once you learn it, oh, it transforms your interactions, and it exponentially increases your value in the situation. Because at the end of the day, they're coming to you because they believe that some way you can help them get where they want to go. They're not coming to you just because they want to be in, like, this isn't the you concert, right? Like, this isn't, we go to Beyonce concerts or to Taylor Swift concerts or whatever concerts y'all go to, right? Like people go to those concerts, Wiz Khalifa, blah, 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 right? They go to those concerts because they just want to see the person be amazing. They mm -hmm. go to be entertained and they pay lots of money to go to be entertained, right? People go to David Blaine shows and David Copperfield shows, right? Mm -hmm. To be entertained, right? The Usher concert I heard is amazing out in Vegas, right? His residency, like people go to be entertained. They go to watch Usher do what Usher does. It's not about them at all, it's about watching Usher do what Usher does. Hey, Usher, go be amazing. I'm just going to sit here and chill. And by wow. you being amazing, I'm going to get value. Uh, 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 Spoiler uh, alert. This, this is clashing with that. Uh, I tell you, <laughs> Rob, on uh, every fiber of my being wants to disagree, but I know that there's wisdom in there. And I'll right. say, I'll know that you're right. 
simply <laughs> because be, because look, solopreneurs, you're I need you to hear this mostly. Mm-hmm. We're used to doing our own thing. And we mm-hmm. take our own counsel. And we've done that mm-hmm. and created that moat for a reason. Mm-hmm. We realize we have this, this thing, this dynamic. We and we, we don't want to fight, you know, maybe when we were younger mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. you're 22, you're like, hey, put them up. Right. Yeah. But now you're starting to think, I ain't got time for that. Mm-hmm. So you do your and it's thing, easy that, to not have time for it. it, it, it what is a part of the rounding of you, right? And this is why I'm even accepting counsel on this. And I want to I want to caveat it too. Go ahead, we'll go, finish yeah, your but, point, and then I want to I want to caveat. It's about that. Rob says this to me a lot. She's he said he'll say if you want to be a leader, and I'm going, dude, I want to lead my own stuff. I, you know, make my money, <laughs> and I'm good to go. But if you want to be in a position where you're not constantly coming up against clashes because you're going to be working with people. You're going to need to persuade them that your idea works or you show them how they get their idea. So that has been the struggle for me personally. I'm Mm going to just be 100 transparent. And now that I've taken on a, okay, I'll help you. People say, hey, I like what you're doing. Can you help me? Oh, yeah. And then they don't want to do what you say, do it. And you go, they hate me and I don't like them either. (laughs) Right? <laughs> exactly and, and then exactly. that's where we are we we kind of struggle with that and then you go back into your little cubby hole like i was talking about at the breakfast uh, right? <laughs> you want to go back in your little cubby hole and just mm-hmm. build up your thing you know exactly. get your get your ai and and, and mm-hmm. get your virtual assistants and says you know what i don't have to deal i with don't this need mess. that right and something that's is really interesting about dilemma. that something is really interesting about that is because because the caveat that i wanted to put out was because we know there's two different types of business, right? You got product businesses and you got service businesses. Now, with product businesses, it's easy because product businesses are, and I won't say easy, it's different. And it allows for that kind of insulation from dealing directly with the customer because the product deals with the customer. You, as the product maker, don't have to. You build the product to serve the customer. That way, you ain't got to deal with them, right? Steve Jobs built, right? They built the iPhone. The iPhone does all the stuff that the customer wants the iPhone to do. Steve Jobs doesn't have to constantly help people figure out what they want, right? And so a lot of entrepreneurs go through this journey in the product business, right? Mm -hmm. They create things that people like, like entertainment. They create things and the things that they create, people go, ooh, ah, yes, this is awesome. This is amazing. And so they, we get used to being right my product is right, and it does what it's supposed to do, and therefore people like me because I'm the creator of that product. Mm-hmm. When you go into the service business, it's different because the product is help, right? And so many of the people think that the product is advice, but it's not. In the service business, the product is help, which is qualitative and quantitative, right? But the, the the issue is the product and the value of the product is in the eye of the person that you're helping, and it's divorced from a pricing structure or anything else because at the end of the day, they have to feel like you've helped them, and there's no logic you can't say, well, I told you this, 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 this. Therefore, I have helped. Yeah. Yeah. Because Only in the service say business. So. <laughs> exactly. Because in the service business, unlike in the product business, in the product business, they've already made the determination that this product is what's going to help me. I need that product to do what I want to do, right? Even if it's food, right? I need this food to satiate my belly and make my taste buds feel good. And therefore, I'm going to go get that. They've already decided what they need, and you're just providing them with what they need. But oftentimes in the service business, they're still trying to figure out what they need, and we propose our service as the solution for what they need. But it, with, within how we put it forward, within a, how we sell it, all the rest of those types of things, we're engaging them in the process because we know that that's a better sales process for services, and that's how you do higher ticket sales. But the problem mm-hmm. is when with doing higher ticket sales in that way, what you also do is you incur the responsibility of delivering value in the eye of the beholder, not just in the eye of the deliverer. 
Gosh, I like the way this is going, man. And what's even more interesting to me is something you said earlier. And it, it encompasses the thesis when I say your customers hate you. This is what I really mean. Your mm -hmm. clients hate you. Is that if they continue to look at you as the savior of them, they're going to have a feeling about that. If they exactly. continue to look at you as you know, you're the white knight, you know, you're the, you're, you're the person on the, on the horse and blah, blah, blah. And you just came in and fixed their thing. Now they're going to say, man, I must be really dumb if I continually need them. So they're going to want to try to get rid of you. They're going to want to have Power a feeling about you. Power struggle. That's yeah. what I'm getting to. And you're exactly, you. oh, wow. You're right. That, 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 that articulation of it is yeah. really powerful you're, because you're right. of the ego. Yeah. yeah. When I hear that, when I'm talking to a client, they say, oh, you're right. You're right. I says, look, I don't want to be right. I just want to have the information that makes you right. And I have done this in other settings, but sometimes mm -hmm. forget. So sometimes exactly. you and, need and that, this thing. kind of counsel yeah. to remind you yeah. of what yeah. this is really all about. No, I agree. I agree with you. And it, I mean, it happens to me still, too. Like, that's the whole thing. Like, it's not like I've got past it. Like I told you, I used to have this problem a lot. And I remember I was dealing with a client just recently. And one of the things that was happening was I wasn't realizing that as they made changes to the scope of what we were doing, it really made me feel like wasn't I, I didn't have the same certainty that I was going to be able to deliver what I had promised to deliver them. Ah, and so creep. we started scope creep, right? So we started running into this scope creep. And in my desire to try to get them to see the scope creep, right? I wasn't able to just ask them the question, which is, what would you like me to do since you've changed what you have told me that you wanted me to do? Like, I didn't, I wasn't able to deal with the thing specifically. And so there was a tension that was being created, right? And, and that I was aware of, but that I was trying to kind of, right? You have been in those situations where like you pissed off, but you're trying to act like you're not pissed off, but everybody know you pissed off, right? Like, like it, was, it was one of those Everybody's situations. Everybody's looking at you like, ooh, he's about to blow. Exactly. Like the energy in the room has shifted, whether you want to admit that the energy in the room has shifted or not. Right. Like I was in that situation. And so it was one of those things where it came to a head with the client and we actually had to sit down and, and kind of have a talk. And once we were able to, to kind of articulate, look, this is what's going, this is what's happening to me when you all do this. So here's what I need from you. Then it was really kind of easy because they were able to say, well, that's not, we don't need that from you. We, we're good with you. We, you. You're good. You don't have, you don't have to. And so they were able to release some of the pressure that was there. But I had to learn that I had to acknowledge the pressure that was there and ask for that release rather than trying to kind of shift them back to the original scope. And I think this is one of the things like it was, it was an epiphany moment for me with dealing with entrepreneurs. Again, kind of what I was telling you, entrepreneurs are scope creep by definition. Right. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are people Ooh, who have seen the world. Stuff to that bucket. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Because they have seen the world. They have seen their path. And they said, mm, no, nah, I think there's a better way. I think we can do it differently. I think we can go over here. They've, they've changed their lives by creeping into a scope that wasn't their path. And they continue to do that. And they continue to add value. So when yeah. you go to work for entrepreneurs, scope creep, you have to adjust. Is a, 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 It's a natural part of the game. What you have to be able to do is to, and this is a term, a phrase that I love that, that, that you coined, is you have to manage the agreements with regard to scope creep. You have to That's make perfect. sure that when you see scope creeping, you're like, hey, I'm not saying it's wrong. I don't mind what you're doing. I just need you to tell me what you want me to do in this space so that we can negotiate whether or not I'm comfortable doing that or whether this is outside of what I'm comfortable with. So we can either stop working together mm -hmm. or we can shift our agreement on what us working together was going to be so that when we come back and we're talking about what's valuable to you, we can have a, we can have receipts where you said this was valuable to you and I gave you this. You said this was valuable to you and I gave you this. You said this was valuable to you and I gave you this. So, right. And and I think that fear sometimes that, that we have as experts is that, and I've had this happen to me, I'm sure you've had it happen to you before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you don't manage those agreements, they'll get to the end. You'll have done everything they ask, but they'll act like it's not value. Mm. And that is something that's like nails on chalkboard. Like, like that's something that literally, when you talk about do, hating your clients or whatever, like that's the type of stuff where I'm like, it makes me want to put somebody's head through a wall. Like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do everything you ask me to do. Here, and it metaphorically, right? You know, I, I'm a reformed violence person, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> He's a jujitsu guy. <laughs> exactly, right? I don't fight anymore. I just give people hugs and they go to sleep, right? <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, I think that 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 tussle that that you hating your client, your client, your client hating you is that space of for us as service providers, our validation 
like we talked about earlier, isn't helping. And when we feel like the client is the one denying us the ability to help because of their scope creep, because of their inability to stay disciplined, because of whatever it is that's with them, it starts creating this this negative energy, right? But we have wow. to remember. That's powerful, y'all. That's powerful. Yeah, yeah. And But we have to remember for us that that's our problem. That's not their problem. That I think that encapsulated. And I kept saying to my own self, this is your problem. This is your problem. Mm -hmm. And then as Rob talked to me, and as you know, he, you know, he's a leadership guy, right? So this is, this is what he does for a living. Um, and I started kind of I started getting that idea and looking back on other relationships when they started turning sour, what was it? And I was still at the center of that. So now that's not to say that I'm trying to disqualify myself as working with no. you. No, but no. In learning, this is going to be the dynamic. It's like being able to see what is a natural thing, frame controls. What's a natural thing? I'm the expert. What's a natural thing? I'm the owner. It's a natural thing. I want to want you to show me how to do what I want to do. Knowing that now, yep. if that's a natural thing, having been forewarned and mm -hmm. or get this, everyone, and or now been given a framework to now how to deal with it. Yeah. This yep. was this this was the whole cast, right? Well, this is what we yep. wanted to get to. I needed it personally. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm going to share my gifts with others, I gotta understand that as I look at the dynamics and how they play out, that sometimes you're gonna be the problem and you have mm -hmm. to solve for that. Yeah. And the last thing that I want to leave everybody with, it, especially regarding a framework of that, is one of the best tools that you can use, right? And this is a tool from my days as a lawyer. One of the best tools that you can use in situations like this in order to not be the bad guy, in order to not be the person wagging your finger in somebody's face, in order to not be the person pushing back and all the rest of that. It's a tool called shifting the burden. Shifting. And so shifting the burden. And so like in, in, in court cases, right, they're adversarial. There's there's two sides. And generally one side will have a burden of proof on a particular thing. They'll have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt or beyond, you know, to a preponderance of the evidence, whatever the burden is. But if you're effective at your job, you can actually shift the burden to the other side that they have to prove something before you have to carry your burden. <laughs> right. And it's, it's, it's important because when you can do that, now they're the one that has to do all of the the, the, the the tap dancing and the figuring stuff out and the explaining rather than you having to be that. And so in the in the context of what we're talking about, if you're ever in situations where you really can't see the way forward, where you're like, I don't get this, right? I'm the expert and I'm not seeing how we're going to be successful. But the other side is extremely adamant that they can be successful. What you want to do is shift the burden. Stop being the expert for that moment. Be the learner. Start asking questions and start getting them to explain to you what they see. Mm. Because what I have found is that oftentimes they will, it'll, it'll happen. One of two things will happen. Either A, they won't really be seeing anything that you don't see. They're just not looking at everything that you see, which in that term, it's, it's a slow walk for them to see all the minds in the minefield, right? And so they're like, oh, I didn't know that was there. Oh, yeah, that can blow us up. Oh, I didn't know that was there. Yeah, that can blow us up. And it's because they're showing you the minefield and walking through it with you because you don't, because you're, you're, you're working at it. The other one, which is even more important and I think more helpful to you as you grow is sometimes they will show you things that you couldn't see. And so you will yeah. learn yeah. and you will be exposed to more information to a new world because you stopped being the expert and you realize, mm -hmm. as Jordan Peterson says, that everybody has something to teach you. Now, oh, my gosh. Uh, and this is what I had wrote down, Rob, to, to your point. I says, imagine this statement that they're feeling. Can you help me do what I want to do? That's it. Can you help me do what I want to do? And that's that yeah. constant question. And now as I look back at bringing on the onboarding of this particular client, I started at, now I can see it. Basically what he was asking me, can you help me do what I want to do? What I do, I came in with a strategy, my strategy, based on experience, based on what works, and forgot that I'm here to help them do, him do, her do, 
but they want to do that. I love it. Too. I love it. All right, that, in, that, that's, that's in that it. articulation, in that articulation you just did real quick, you said, can you help me do what you want me to do? When you came in with your plan, you were like, yes, I can do what you want to do. That's my plan. And Rob, the, Rob, Rob told but, me this. He says, you know, otherwise <laughs> people just think you just took over their plan. Right. And that's it. That's the thing that that thing you just dropped the nugget. I want everybody to catch that. The, the, the key thing that, that, that you just dropped was when they come in saying, can you help me do what I want to do? We come in as experts saying, of course, I can do what you want to do. And that's not what they asked us for. What they asked us for was to help them do what they want to do. And we're like, no, 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 just give it to me. Just give it to me. I'll do it so much faster. <laughs> and and as we as we end this, everyone, I was thinking about how I should start calling this. I actually have a site that I'm going to be spinning up um, called the Business Bartender, and it's all the, all the business bartender does is listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as you think about the whole concept of bartender, mm -hmm. it's all about now it's bartender and butt tender. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all they're basically doing is saying, "Say, so what are you going to do, Mac?" So that's yep. what that was the whole idea. It's like, yep. what do you want to do? I let them talk. So this is the site, right? I'm letting you in on a little secret here. Uh, so mm -hmm. the site was going to be like, people come in, I can't believe this. And you go, oh, what are you going to do? And you mm -hmm. advise in a way that shows them stuff that you know, but at the same time, you're asking them, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? What are yep. you going to do? Yep, 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 yep. I love it. All right, everybody. Let's talk again soon. <laughs> Will do.